Good morning, everyone. I'm going to present you the BG database this morning. Uh, and first, I would like to emphasize that BG is not my work alone, obviously, it's the work of a team. This is the team as of a year ago. Of course, there's always a bit of turnover, but it's pretty stable. Um, in the people with red circles will be presenting today. Frédéric in the middle of the red circles will be giving the other half of the lectures this morning, and Sarah and Julien here will be giving the hands on this afternoon, also help to prepare all this. And if you have any questions in the future, we have an email which we monitor, so don't hesitate to ask us whether you need new features or don't understand something or you have a bug to report or whatever. So what is BG? It's a database of gene expression. Our aim is to understand gene expression and help biologist users. So we try to really be at the interface of these two missions to make the gene expression data useful to people. And for this, we work both on improving the data and on making tools which make it useful. I'm going to go through a number of concepts which are important to BG and to databases to understand what we have and how we do it. And the first important concept is bio-curation. Indeed, there are two main types of databases in the life sciences uncurated databases and curated databases. A typical uncurated database is GeneBank. In GeneBank, anyone who submits sequences, the sequences are there. So the advantage is complete. Anyone who submits the sequences, the sequences are there, so you know that all the sequences are indeed there. But there is a lot of redundancy. Several people can submit the same sequence, and they do. There is low organization. There's no guarantee that people put all the information you need, or even that the information they put is correct or written in the right way to find it. So the main added value is that it's complete and very up to date, but it is not very organized and not very useful for recovering knowledge. The opposite of this are curated databases. The typical example is the SwissProt component of the UniProt KB database. In curated databases, the data is verified, redundancy is removed and annotations are standardized, and this is done manually by experts, who are called curators, who verify the knowledge and its structure in the database. So the main added value of a curated database is that the knowledge is organized and reliable and easy to recover. It is not necessarily quite up to date. So in SwissProt, you will not have every protein sequence up to date, but the ones you have will be non-redundant and with reliable annotation. And underneath, I put the definition of the bi of bicuration from the International Society of Bicuration, of which Frédéric is in the executive committee. So in BG, we are curated database, and for this, we use annotation. Annotation is associating a biological object to a feature based on evidence. So that sounds very abstract. So for example, if you have a gene and it has a gene ontology term associated to it, this association was an annotation. You can annotate automatically without curation. For example, you say every gene in a new genome I sequenced, I'll give it all the geo terms, all the gene ontology terms from the first blast hit I get in Uniprot. Then it's not curated. You just automatically transfer it. Or you can say, I read a paper about this gene. In this paper, they describe a function with experimental evidence. And thus, based on this evidence, I will give this gene ontology term to this gene. And that is then curated annotation. And in BG, we do curated annotation. So BG is a curated database. First, all the expression that we include into the database is verified. We have criteria, which Frederick and I will explain later. And data which does not fulfill this criteria is excluded. So we only include data which has been verified a priori by our curators. And then every data set that we include is annotated to the right annotation terms by manual curation, reading the description in GEO or RA Express, and when needed, when it's unclear, reading the paper, reading the supplementary material, checking the website, sometimes even contacting the authors. And these annotations follow standards, which are themselves curated, and I'll explain some of these standards later, so that it's a work which is reproducible and reliable. So the main way we annotate is to ontologies. I've already spoken about the gene ontology. I will speak a bit more about ontologies now. What is an ontology? An ontology is first a list of terms so that we agree which words we use. But 
just a list of terms as a control vocabulary, which is already very important so that we don't use different words for the same thing. So we don't use, for example, arm or upper limb or something else, depending on who says it, but we always use the same words so that we can then easily recover the information attached to these terms. In addition, we define these terms so that we can know what they mean and reason on them, and sorry, and uh, use them. And when we have definitions of terms, we have a dictionary. What makes an ontology is that we always have, also have relations between the terms. So for example, if I say that the hand is part of the arm, that the arm is attached to the top of the body, these are relations between terms. If I say the brain is in the head, it is a relation between terms. If I say the brain is part of the nervous system, it is a relation between terms. When we have these relations, we can reason on them. We can say any gene was expressed in the brain is also expressed necessary in the nervous system since the brain is part of the nervous system. And you can see that we can have different types of relations because the relation between the brain and the nervous system is not the same as the brain relation between the brain and the head. The brain is in the head, but it's part of the nervous system. And we can have more complex relations such as some structures develop from others in embryogenesis, some structures interact with other structures, etc. So we have these different types of relations and together the terms, the definitions and the relations form an ontology which allows us to annotate our data in a reliable and reproducible manner and to reason on these uh, annotations. So the typical example of ontology that everyone knows in the life sciences is the gene ontology. So here you see, I hope you see my mouse, we see a term, cell migration in hindbrain, and we see that it has relations is a, here are the types of relations, so hind, cell migration in hindbrain is a hindbrain development, is a cell migration. But we also have other relations, for example, brain development is part of the central nervous system, but is a animal organ development. We see that an ontology is a graph, not a tree, because one term can have several parents, and one term can have several children. And these are used in annotation. For example, I spoke about Swiss prot, where uh, notations are manually curated. Here I have homeobox protein Hox B1A with manually curated annotations to gene ontology terms, including this cell migration in hindbrain, which is here. In uh, BG, the main ontology we use does not describe gene function, but anatomy, because we describe gene expression in animals and gene expression in animals, the main feature is that it's expressed in different parts of the anatomy. So we use Uberon, which is an ontology which was made from first aligning and merging different model organism species specific ontologies of anatomy. So anatomy ontology describing mouse anatomy, zebrafish anatomy, Drosophila, Melanogaster anatomy, etc. And then enriching this with additional terms, additional relations, to describe as much as possible all animals. Now, of course, this is always a work in progress, whether it's the gene ontology or Uberon, every ontology captures our knowledge at a given point in time. And as we learn more, or as just we have time to add things, it improves. So whenever you use an ontology, be careful to use a recent version and do not be surprised that it improves with our knowledge because anything which captures comp computationally our state of knowledge at a given point is going to change as our knowledge changes. Now, what makes an ontology useful? Sorry, I think I heard that I had a question, but I don't know how to see it. <laughs> okay, I'll continue this for now. What makes an ontology useful? What makes the gene ontology useful is that it is used by many resources. So you can see the same terms. In the same way, Uberon is made so that it's common to all animal species. So it can be used in different applications to different species, whether it's human health, farm animal, model organisms such as fly or nematode or zebrafish and so on. For example, it's used in large projects such as GTEC, Phantom, and now the human side atlas. An ontology is more useful if it covers a large domain of knowledge, such as gene function or animal anatomy, which is relevant to all animals and relevant to a lot of functions. And an ontology is more useful if 
there are many tools leveraging it. So for example, with gene ontology, many people use gene ontology enrichment tools, which make the gene ontology directly useful. So I will present today tools which we develop, which use Uberon. Of course, other people can also leverage Uberon. Um, and this is it's newer than the gene ontology, so it's a work in progress. So we annotate to four types of conditions all this manually curated in BG. Anatomy, which is the biggest number of terms and work of annotation, which is what I just showed you. We annotate to Uberon, so we can be very precise because Uberon also includes, goes down to cell types, so you can be very general, say this is expressed in the body or in the head, or you can be very precise, this is expressed in beta cells of the pancreas. We also annotate to development and life stages, so we have an ontology per species that we develop and make available to the community, which describes from zygote to old age each species. And this has to be per species because development and aging is a bit different in each species. And the ontologies we develop for this are now reference ontologies and are used, for example, by the uh, GTEC or Human Cell Atlas for human. We also annotate sex, which in most species is simple, male or female, or undefined when we did not get the information, and in some species a bit more complex, but I don't think I'll go into detail of this now. If someone is working on with Daphnia or ants, you can ask us. And we also annotate when the information is available, strains or populations, so for humans it will be populations, like European ancestry or uh, Japanese ancestry and so on. And for model organisms, it would be strains. And for livestock, it can be uh, different uh, breeds. This information we don't always have, and we only put it when we are sure of it, when it is clearly provided by the people who provided the data. And again, all of this is manually verified by a curator. Now, I told you earlier that we only integrate some types of data. So the main curation we do at that point is to only take what we call wild type healthy or normal expression. So the idea is that we want gene expression which is informative on the causal function of the genes and which is evolutionarily relevant. What do I mean? The causal function is a concept in biology that this is the function for which something was selected. It's the function which it has to do. For example, the function of BRCA1 is not to cause breast cancer. That's when there are mutations, a problem can arise, which is breast cancer. But the primary function of the gene is not to cause a cancer. Okay? And so each gene, in the same way that the heart, its primary function is to pump blood, its primary function is neither to make noise in our chest nor to have heart attacks, the primary function of a gene is what it was selected to do. And this we would not learn from the expression in the cancer or in the knockout. We will learn from the uh, expression in the wild type healthy individual. So wild type healthy means we do not take cancers, we do not take diseases, we do not take uh, experimental mutants such as knockout, knockdown, knock-in. We do not take modifications where you put a chemical product in the tank or in the food, or when you put, uh, uh, you modify the expression by say, uh, microRNA injection or something. So wild type healthy. Now some cases you can discuss, what is the exact definition of healthy? So we try to be rather broad and to capture maximum information because sometimes you can eat a little bit more or a little bit less and it's still healthy. Um, evolutionary relevant because if I want to compare the gene expression, say I want to find conserved expression in the brain between different mammals, I want to compare the expression in the healthy brain. I don't want to compare a healthy mouse brain to a tumor in a human brain because this does not inform me on the conserved expression. And while when we started BG, our main concerns were these two, we have found with experience that's actually very relevant for biomedical studies where often you have data on medical issues, so diseases, cancers, and so on, mutants. And you want to be able to see how does this compare to the default, what I have when I am healthy. And we can provide that reference and guarantee that we verified it carefully. So I'll give an example of how we have 
uh, curated this wild type healthy from the GTEC data. So the GTEC is the Genotype Tissue Expression Project. It's a very large project to do RNA-seq and genotyping from many humans with many tissues sampled. And if you look at the definition on the homepage of GTEC, they say from non-diseased tissue sites. And many studies use the GTEC data as a reference of healthy. But if you look in the FAQ, you see we have not excluded specific donors from specific tissues based on their cause of death or medical history. So in fact, you do not know that they were healthy. And so our curators read all the descriptions and all the pathology reports of all the data in the version six of GTEC. And we found that many were not actually healthy data, healthy people. So about, so there were 179, uh, about a third of the, the individuals used, whom we did not use at all. We did not use people who died of drug abuse, who died with an invasive cancer, who were morbidly obese, and so on. And then among another quarter, there were many where we discarded at least one tissue. For example, if someone had Alzheimer, we kept the liver tissue, the muscle tissue, but not the brain tissue. If someone had ascites, which was a liver disease, we did not keep the liver, but we kept the brain, the muscle, the intestine, etc. And so in total, after this large amount of work, which represented actually one year full-time equivalent of curation by several people, we kept only half the samples of GTEC version 6. So half the samples are in fact not representing healthy gene expression, the gene expression which was either modified by drugs or impacted by a very severe disease. And we do this for every data set we integrate, even though usually it's less work than for GTEC, which is the largest data set that we have. So in total for GTEC version six, out of 11,900 libraries, we kept 4,800, which is about half. And we annotated in the database, in our annotation files, very detailed, the exact anatomical entity, the exact age, the sex and the ethnicity. I should say that also we removed those where the pathology report showed that they did not actually sample the anatomical entity that they said they would sample. So you can have that the GTEC guidelines said to sample a certain tissue and the pathology report says I didn't manage quite and I took a bit of the tissue next to it. And in GTEC this will be put annotated to the original tissue wanted, but it's actually not true, so we remove it. And we are not allowed to make all this data available because GTEC is uh, restricted data because of the respect of the privacy of the people who donated. So we provide, of course, all the expression annotated to the exact anatomical entity, but not the exact age and not the ethnicity. And so in the end from GTEC, we get 539 conditions, which a condition is a combination of anatomy, age, sex, in 75 anatomical entities. What are the types of expression data that we integrate into BG? So there are different ways to measure expression and the oldest large scale, quote unquote, because it's not so large scale modern standards, the first untargeted way to obtain gene expression was ESTs. So for those of you who would be old enough, you would remember that when we started doing genomics, we started getting expression from this Sanger sequencing of random mRNAs. So it's in BG because we started putting it at the beginning and there's no reason to remove it, but it's no longer updating. And actually the official database of ESTs at the NCBI was retired last year. And we have it in four species, which were the species which we had when we started annotating these ESTs. So it's a bit anecdotal now, but I include it. Now this is very important, in situ hybridization. In situ hybridization is when you do manually experiments of hybridizing typically in an embryo, although it can also be uh, in slices of an adult or depending on the species, a whole adult. And there are 44,000 in situ experiments in BG, which correspond to 343,000 evidence lines. An evidence line would be saying here, 
RER gamma is expressed in, for example, here the end of the tail. And we do not annotate this directly. We have agreements with the model organism databases of mouse, zebrafish, C. elegans, and Drosophila melanogaster, so that we can recover the data they already curate. This is not to duplicate work. There's enough curation to do in the world that we can let them curate this, which is their main job, and they do it very well. And we curate other types of data. But we integrate it, and it's very important because in situ hybridization provides an amazing level of detail. Usually, when you do large scale experiments, you take big chunks of body. You take brain, you take liver. When you do in situ hybridization, you can be extremely specific on where the gene is expressed. And this information is very precious for us to be able to say where genes are expressed. And although these are small scale experiments, there are many of them. So you see, we still have quite a lot of data. 44,000 in situ experiments is not nothing. Now, the big source of data for transcriptomics has been microarrays historically, and we only took affymetrics because they were the most common and we did not want to have to manage different data types, which didn't bring a lot of information. So microarrays, unlike ESTs or in situ, are quantitative, and they cover mostly the, all the transcriptome, not all, because you need a probe set for the gene, and if you did not know this gene or did not manage to synthesize a good probe set for this gene, then it's not there. It is very important because a lot of experiments have been done with microarrays, really a lot, and many of these have not been redone. So it is easy for young researchers to think, okay, we don't need microarrays because we have RNA-seq. And it's true that today I would not do a microarray experiment. I would do an RNA-seq experiment. It is better. But if you want to use historical data, a lot of data on aging, we only have microarray data. A lot of data on circadian rhythm, we only have microarray data. A lot of data where reproducing the experiments is costly or very heavy have not been reproduced yet. And so the microarray data is still very important to complete our view of the, of the gene expression. We have at present 12,000, 1,200, sorry, experiments annotated in BG, which corresponds to 12,000 chips. It's for more species than uh, in situ hybridization, although not all species, because only species for which a reliable affymetrics microarray was indeed developed and used. And we do a lot of quality control, which Frédéric Bastien will explain to you in more detail. But one thing I would just mention is that we remove redundant chips. And this, we are the only ones, as far as we know, who do, because we discovered this problem. Many people would submit different experiments with different experiment identifiers to the databases, but using the same control experiment. So they would just resubmit the same data exactly as if it's a new experiment. That shows a problem of uncurated database and of redundancy and uncurated database. If you take all the affymetrics data from, say, human or mouse from GEO or RA Express, you will have the same experiment several times and it will increase your statistical confidence wrongly. We remove this. Finally, the bulk of the data nowadays is RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq, should I say, most of you know RNA-seq, I suppose. It's quantitative. It can cover the whole transcriptome. Unlike uh, microarrays, we don't need to design a specific one for each species, so it's very easy to integrate new species. You, once you have a reference genome, the RNA-seq would be of good quality in every species. We have at present 8,400 libraries annotated, and it's our main effort of annotation right now is increasing this. We also do quality control that Frédéric would pre present to, and although we can integrate different types of RNA-seq libraries, right now our priority is to poly A ones which target messenger RNAs, so the gene expression of protein coding genes. Of course, with this you sometimes recover also expression of other genes, and we integrate it, but we have not right now given priority to say specific uh, libraries for short RNAs or long non-coding RNAs. This will probably be in the future. Now we have these different data types and we need to bring them together. So we do data integration, that's a very important part of BG. BG is not just a pile of data, it is data which is integrated to give you biological knowledge about the genes, about the organs, and about the expression. So this is a very broad view of how we integrate the data. We have these different data types I already mentioned, the ESTs from these databases, Affymetrics from RA Express and Geo, RNA-seq from SRA, GEO, and dpGaP, which is where the restricted data such as GTEC lives, and in-situ hybridization data from model organ databases. 
and on all the data that we ourselves annotate, we do quality control, condition filtering, which means we remove what is not healthy and wild type. We reanalyze the data to make sure we detect active expression and we map everything to the Uberon ontology, even that which comes from the model organ databases because they, they do not necessarily use Uberon or in the same way that we do. And then all this is integrated, all curated on the same condition, all mapped to the Uberon ontology, all integrated into BG. And how do we integrate these very different data types? There are different ways to do it. And one main way we do it is that from every data type we call genes expressed present or absent. Okay, I hope this does not disturb the microphone because I hear noise from works next door. I'm sorry about this. Uh, this being said, I've already taught in a classroom with works next door, so this thing happens. So cause present absent is something which is comparable between all data types. If I have an in-situ exp hybridization experiment, I can say this gene is expressed in this place, yes or no. But I can also get similar information from if I have an EST, the gene is expressed. If I have a significant microarray signal, the gene is expressed. If I have significant RNA-6 signal, the gene is expressed. And what do we mean by significant in these cases? Frédéric Bastien will go into more detail. And we also use this expression in a more quantitative way to see how important is the expression of a gene in a given anatomical structure, in a given organ, tissue, cell type. And for this, we use a score which takes into account the rank of the gene expression from every data type in every anatomical structure. And this uses, again, we can apply it to each data type in a different way, and then we can integrate these scores so that we can have, in the end, one score which represents how, much, how important the expression of a gene is in a given anatomical structure and age or developmental stage. And so, in the end, we can give you an information which integrates everything. You don't have to look separately what is the information from RNA-seq? What's the information from microarray? What is the information from in situ? Which in the other database, you have to look at these things separately. We give you one information where we have summarized the knowledge in an expert way. BG covers many species. Most of the examples I took now for a human, but in fact, we cover right now 29 species. So obviously human and the main model organ of animals, so mouse, zebrafish, Sophia menogaster, C. elegans, but also you see here a variety of uh, mammals, some other vertebrates, some flies. And one of our priorities in the future is increasing this as we have good reference genomes and sufficient transcriptome data. So we have already curated data for the next BG release, just it takes time to run all our uh, pipeline and software to put the release out there, but it will come out this year and we will have almost 18,000 new RNA-seq libraries. Well, that's what was curated. We'll still do the quality control and it will add many primates, many, many new fishes and many other species which might interest some of you or not others, some relevant to agriculture such as turkey or sheep or honeybee, some evolutionarily interesting such as the coelacant or the cyanimony, etc. If you have an animal which you would really like to see in BG, do not hesitate to send us an email. Two conditions have to be met. There has to be an animal, because we do not integrate, for example, plants or fungi. And when there needs to be expression data available for diverse anatomical structures. If you have your favorite mosquito species, and all that was done was whole body transcriptome to annotate the genome, we cannot integrate it because there's no anatomy to annotate it to, so it would not, we could put it, but it would not add anything, any knowledge. We leverage anatomy. And speaking of anatomy, since we want to have, we have different species, we want to be able to compare them. And to be able to compare them, we use the concept of homology. So you all know autologous genes probably, which allow you to compare genes between species. We can also define such concepts at the anatomical level. So for example, if you want to compare the tetrapod lung to zebrafish data, if you want to compare it to the homologous structure, the homologous structure is the swim bladder, not the gills. This is the homologous structure between tetrapods and ray fin fishes. And so we manually annotate the anatomical homology between the different anatomical structures among animals. 
And so how this is done, it is by reading papers of Ivo Divo, evolutionary developmental biology, of paleontology, and of comparative anatomy, and so on. It is not from our gene expression data. This is very important, because if you compare the gene expression between anatomical structures which are declared homologous in BG, it is not a circular reasoning. We did not use these data to define the homology. The homology was defined from external expert evidence from papers. And sometimes this even forces us to improve Uberon. As I told you, such things are work in progress. For example, here, there was a paper which showed the homology between annelids and chordates for the chord, which is kind of like, think of the vertebral colon and the, the uh, nerve, nerve in the back. Uh, so there is a chord in the back of all chordates and vertebrates is where the vertebrae and the, um, I'm missing words here, but the, the nervous system in the back is. And in other animal species, it's different. And the annelids, there is an axochord. So we had to add a presumptive axochord term so that we could define the homology between the notochord and the axochord. And then we capture this information in a very detailed manner according to every statement which was made in every paper. So here you see a detailed table from our curator work. We have the homology between the axochord and the notochord, defined the, hom the Uberon terms, the type of homology, the references, the type of evidence we use, which are the same codes as used in the gene ontology, the evidence, how confident we are, because maybe in the paper they say that this is clearly showing this, or maybe they say this indicates, so we capture this, at what level it is homologous, so two things can be homologous at different uh, evolutionary levels, and who annotated it, so, and the supporting text from the paper or the book. So we capture this in detail, and this is available publicly on our GitHub, but because not everyone wants such a level of detail, we also summarize it, so here you just have that these two classes, notochord and axochord, are homologous in bilateria, and these two classes uh, are homologous in bilateria also, and this is then something that you can simply use. And again, this is available on our GitHub, and it's also used in BG. So this is the end of my first part. I went a bit faster than I expected because I'm really not used to speaking with no one in front of me looking at me and asking me questions. I'm sorry about that, so I hope I was clear. Um, so we have more time for questions. Please don't hesitate to ask.